welcome back, everybody. I'd like to introduce Aurelion Aptel, and he's going to be speaking on SMB CMP, a new tool to diff network captures. If you could please make him uh, feel welcome. All right. So yeah, my name is Aurelien. Uh, I work for uh, Suze from Germany. Uh, it's been a long way uh, home here. Um, I work in the Samba team, uh, which is, should really be called the SMB team because it involves other things uh, than Samba. There is a Samba server, but there is also the kernel client to mount remote shares, CIFS, CIFS, which is the main thing I work on. But other, also other um, tools like um, CIFS utils, which allows you to interact with the file system to set, for example, um, access control lists and uh, things which are, doesn't really exist in POSIX. I uh, also work on uh, Wireshark, on the SMB dissectors, and uh, other SMB-related things like uh, Pike. So uh, this talk is about uh, the different things I use uh, to debug um, SMB issues, and they are also applicable to other network protocols. Um, so um, while debugging things, I ended up writing a new tool, which I'll present in this talk. Uh, so this can be useful for developers, but also sysadmins to diagnose network issues. So initially the talk was about uh, the SMB protocol, but yeah, uh, I think uh, many of the things I'm talking about can be made uh, generic enough for any other protocol. So uh, network debugging is hard. There is not uh, one single way to debug everything. Uh, so depending on your problem, uh, some approaches work better than others. So when dealing with uh, network issues, you can have bugs in uh, your client implementation, in your server implementation, sometimes in both. Uh, sometimes the specification, so if, you have a, if you're lucky enough to have a specification, sometimes the specification is wrong. For SMB, we're pretty lucky because Microsoft now releases uh, an official specification for the latest version of their protocols. Uh, so sometimes the specification is wrong. Uh, sometimes the behavior is completely unspecified, so you're trusting uh, the reference implementation, re reference implementation, which happens to be uh, Windows usually for SMB. So yeah, a lot of possible failures. And uh, so when you work on a bug, you want to isolate as much as possible before digging uh, in into the code. So uh, the first uh, obvious uh, way to go about it is uh, reading the code. So it's kind of inevitable, I think. Uh, so the way I go about it is usually I read the spec uh, to get a feeling of uh, how it's supposed to work on the client side or on the server side. Then I read the, the corresponding code path uh, when it's open source. Of course, it's not always the case for uh, Windows. We don't really have access to the code. Uh, so you look for bug typos and uh, run logic uh, regarding the spec, uh, and you just repeat this process. Uh, it's very, it can be very long depending on the size of the code. Some buys uh, multiple millions of lines. Uh, a kernel is also pretty big, although uh, CIFS is not uh, as big, but it's, yeah, it's a long process. <coughs> so uh, the, the first, uh, not the first, but the one easy way to uh, uh, find a solution to your bug is uh, using, uh, when, it's, when it's possible, is to use git bisect. So I'm guessing most of you are familiar with it. Um, who has used uh, git bisect or have heard of it? Uh, yeah. Half of the room, I think. Um, so the idea, for those who don't know, is um, here is your history. Uh, you, you have a good commit in the past. Uh, your program was working, and then something uh, went wrong, and uh, your current state doesn't work. So something in between uh, introduced the bug. So instead of trying every single one commit uh, in your history, you, 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 work, uh, with, uh, you do a dichotomy, which is sort of like searching a word in a dictionary. You cut in the middle, uh, you try the one in the middle, the, your, the comment in the middle. If it's good or bad, it becomes uh, your new boundary, and so you just cut your search page in half. And so you just repeat this process, and, and you cut your search page in half at each step. So effectively, it's a logarithmic uh, approach, and uh, it's really powerful. So for the kernel, I've, um, I've went through 130,000 commits uh, in just 17 steps, so it's very efficient. And it can also be automated. So if you have a script where you can test your behavior and uh, the exit code um, uh, reflects the status of whether the bug is here or not, the whole process can be automated. So it's uh, very efficient. 
So another way to uh, debug things is uh, using different, different implementations. So um, yeah, sometimes you don't have a good commit, so it's impractical to find. So in the case of SMB, um, so we have a Windows uh, that has a client and a server. Uh, Samba has a, also a client and a server. And then we have the kernel client. So these are different things we can uh, try to use. So you, you try the, be, uh, the different clients if you have a client bug. You see how the other clients behave, and uh, you try to guess uh, what's going wrong. If one of them works and one doesn't, something is different. Uh, so they do something different. Uh, another way to go is uh, if uh, you have a library, like a low-level library, where you can craft the packets, uh, which is the case for SMB, you can use that. So you can make a one program that does exactly the behavior which is failing, and try to really tweak the fields uh, at a low level to really ease up the, the, the process of finding what's going wrong. <coughs> so yeah, this is mostly SMB information, so yeah. Um, uh, of course, you have the debugger, but for network stuff, it's, uh, it's often impractical because um, so you have two processes not necessarily on the same machine, and if you put uh, breakpoints in your, one of your client or server, often it results in timeout on the other end, so it's hard to reproduce some of the bugs. And so, uh, so depending on how the, if you're debugging the server, for example, Samba, the way Samba works is um, every time a, a, a user authenticates on the server, the server forks. And so uh, the fork process uh, sets the user, the current user of the process to the user who, who is getting authenticated. Um, and so if you're debugging your process, you have to follow the challenge instead of the parent, which is not the default on GDB. So these are the comments I use on GDB to uh, follow the child. Uh, many servers work this way, I think. Or even threads, uh, you can set the user ID uh, similarly. And you want to follow the child, even if it's a thread, basically. Uh, for the kernel side, um, uh, Kimu has a GDB server built in. So the way I usually work on the kernel is I use um, Kimu to boot directly um, the, the, the kernel uh, binary image. And so if you add the dash S flag, it will start a GDB server, which you can connect to from your host. And from there, you can do breakpoints and all those things. But then you're, you, you get the timeouts and all those uh, things I talked about. And it's often impractical. Uh, so even though the kernel ships with uh, so, uh, GDB can be extended with, with uh, Python. And so in the kernel repo, you can find um, Python helpers to do all sorts of things like uh, walking down a, a linked list or listing the super blocks and uh, such things. But uh, the kernel cannot be uh, compiled without optimization. So every time you step in your code, it's, it jumps all over the place. It's uh, hard to uh, follow. And uh, you often have a variable that get optimized out when you try to print them. So you cannot even print them. You have to disassemble the function and find out which register you want to actually see. And, Especially if you want to automate anything, it's very not practical. Some of the code is gets in line when you compile, so also it jumps all over the place. Uh, your stack trace is not clean, and yeah. So there is some, uh, pe some people have been working on uh, the, uh, being able to compile the kernel with, uh, still uh, with enough optimization, but uh, easier to debug. So uh, yeah, it works better with GDB, basically. I haven't really followed the status on that, so I can't really talk about it, but it's, some people are working on that. So uh, another way to, uh, of course, is uh, to work on your bug is uh, looking at logs. So in the case of Samba, well, you can crank up the level to the max uh, with uh, uh, via the, its configuration file. Uh, so I have written a mode for Emacs to look at the logs. Uh, uh, some of the things that, that that mode does that, that can be useful for any log, I think, is uh, highlighting um, patterns. So if you have a bug with a certain IP or certain port, you can set up a um, pattern that would uh, highlight in the log file in different colors, all those things. So you can like, look through quickly and see uh, what pops up, uh, what messages are relevant to you. I think it's a really good uh, thing for logs. Uh, on the kernel side, we, you can make it more verbose this way. So uh, yeah, uh, via procfs, you can enable uh, more verbose debugging. and dynamic debugging and the source tree that uh, is related to SIFs. Of course, we have uh, ftrace uh, as well, which is, uh, records basically all the um, calls that are made in the kernel. Uh, so I have a s s simple example here. 
It's like a deeper S trace, if you're familiar with it. It traces system calls. S -trace, tr sorry, S trace traces system calls, but F trace can trace any calls in the kernel. So there's a, this utility called trace CMD, uh, which you can call. Um, so you, f you first call it with record, you say dash E to say uh, all events, and dash P to recall all the function graph, the function calls. Uh, in this case, I just want to record whatever this process is doing and not system-wide. So I just put this comment. Um, so you run this, uh, then you type uh, trace CMD report, and you basically get an output like this. So on the left side, you can see the process and its PID the time each uh, function takes, uh, each function call takes. And here you can see the <coughs> neatly like, uh, indented uh, function call list of uh, what ended up being called when you run that command. So mount sys end, end up, ends up calling the mount syscall, and so the mount syscall ends up calling those functions in the kernel, so it's very useful to debug uh, things, to see uh, what, what the actual things uh, are called when you run something from user space. So you can do system-wide recording. You don't have to record a uh, single process. So we had a bug, for example, where um, uh, something in uh, the customer system was unmounting his uh, share, and uh, he didn't know what and when. So I told him to run this thing, and this would record all uh, so um, all system call uh, of ID uh, 166, which happens to be uh, the unmount system calls. So as a demo, uh, if you run unmount at the same time, well, in the customer case, you, he let his system run for a while. Uh, then you run uh, the report command, and you see what actually called this unmount. So here you can see the, the, the process name, its PID. And from there, you can see the, um, you know, if you have the PID, you can see the process tree. And you can see who ended up calling umount. And you know, it turns out it was a cron job uh, he had set up, uh, a third party thing. So yeah, very useful. <coughs> So even though I've been using uh, TraceCMD, um, you can also use directly the, via the file system. There's like a virtual file system you, you can use for doing F-Trace. So you don't have to make your customer install anything. You can just send him a bash script and it will get the same result. So yeah, F-Trace is uh, very useful. And of course, you have uh, network captures, which are like wire logs. Um, everything your server or client sends on the wire, you can record and uh, look at after in the Wireshark. So uh, it's very effective, uh, I found. Um, so you can capture and analyze in two steps. You can run a TCP dump on Unix to capture your packets and then copy over your capture on your host where you have all your um, uh, GUI and everything and you can run Wireshark. You can also do natively uh, traces on uh, Windows with NetSH. This is from Windows 7, I believe, starting from Windows 7. And uh, Microsoft has their own tool for uh, analyzing network packets. So originally there was Netmon, which is like 10 years old at this point, I think. Which, uh, so NetSH uh, makes traces similar to F-Trace. It's not limited to uh, network packets. Netmon would only analyze the network packets, but this uh, new tool they wrote called Message Analyzer can actually look at all the events uh, similar to F-Trace. It's uh, very powerful. And of course, you can run Wireshark on uh, Windows as well. So how it works on uh, Linux? Well, it's pretty simple. Uh, you run TCP dump. Uh, you say which interface you want to record which file you want to write to. Uh, then you have dash s to say, uh, so if you're doing very long captures for hours, you, don't have, you, you might not want to have uh, gigabytes of uh, capture. So you can limit, um, you're not interested in the payload, basically you just want the header. So you can say, just record the first 108, uh, 128 bytes of your, each packet, for example. So if you put zero, it just says, uh, it just means uh, record the whole packet. So to uh, filter, to narrow down even more, you can put filters. So you can say only capture packets involving this specific host or this specific port or both, or yeah. So you can see more in the man page. On Windows, it works, uh, so the filtering and narrowing down is a bit more limited, but the, the gist of it is uh, you run NetSH trace start. You put those things, you put the path you want to record. And so the trace gets, uh, the file format of the trace is called ETL, which is uh, even traced uh, log, I think, which uh, Wireshark cannot open, actually. So um, you can open them in Netmon and then export them to PCAP, which Wireshark can read. But I've sort of reversed enough of the file format to actually convert those tra traces to PCAP. If you're interested, uh, have a repo there. To, it's a Python script, it's pretty simple. Um, so you have worked on Wireshark, I've added the decryption support, so you can, um, you can dump the keys uh, in Samba and uh, or the kernel, 
and then feed them to Wireshark so that when you open your trace, you can actually decrypt the traffic, which is uh, very useful. So here's a sample of how, how we would use this for, uh, um, with SMB client. You have this dash dash option, debug encryption, you put yes. It prints out those things. Uh, you just uh, copy paste this in Wireshark. You can feed it through the command line or through the GUI. Uh, similarly, uh, for the kernel, there is this config option you can enable. And it will print out in the console the, those keys. And same, similarly, you just copy paste. Uh, this is what it looks like in the GUI of Wireshark. All right, so um, uh, another way to solve your bug is uh, once you have your, your capture, you want to, if you have a working case and a non-working case, you sort of uh, think, okay, something is wrong in the non-working case, that something is different in this particular capture than from the other, and I want to see what, but sometimes you have a lot of packets, and uh, it's a hard thing uh, to, to look at everything. Um, yeah, so um, you open, uh, the way I would do it before is I would uh, open two instances of Wireshark, one trace in each, and I would uh, look at each packet and uh, expand all the little twisties, and uh, there can be a lot of them, and they can be nested. Uh, it's a long process. And eventually you switch to a different packet, and then you start clicking all over again, so it's very impractical. Uh, so first of all, your index hurts. <laughs> Uh, you end up expanding a lot of fields, uh, and then you skip some because you think, okay, it's probably not going to be there until it actually is. And then uh, your lead hacker eyes might miss uh, just a little difference. So like a little white space, white space uh, an extra white space here, or an uppercase or lowercase here. And uh, when you deal with SMB, you often have uh, slashes, you know, uh, slashes and backslashes in both directions, so something which are easy to, to miss. We can have a bit field with um, different bit uh, sets on one trace and not the other. And uh, sometimes you even have uh, different things which you don't actually care about, like uh, timestamps or uh, random grids or hashes, signatures, uh, things like this. So uh, I thought, okay, let's automate this uh, comparison. Uh, so is there any way to you programmatically use Wireshark? Uh, it turns out not really. The, there is a... Um, there is a library, but it's really tied to the UI somehow, and I couldn't find anyone using it uh, beside the Wireshark program, basically. Um, there, is a t uh, there is a text version of Wireshark called T-Shark, which uh, you can enable when you configure it. It has a text output and uh, also JSON and XML. And there is also a daemon version of Wireshark called the Shark D, but this is sort of undocumented, and I, I just found it by accident, by looking through the source code. And uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know how reliable or how long this will stay in the source tree, so I haven't really uh, tried to use it. But the idea of Shark D is yeah, you, uh, you load your trace in a, in a daemon, and then you can query it uh, without having to uh, close the file and reopen it. Because with T-Shark, if you have different queries to make on your trace, you have to every time call T-Shark, which opens and closes the trace. So a lot of time is uh, wasted this way. So. Yeah. It's a good idea, but I, I don't know what the status of it is. So uh, how, how does uh, T-Shark work? Uh, so you type T-Shark, you do a dash R, and you pass your um, trace. And then you can put a filter here, a display filter. So Wireshark has ways to filter packets. Uh, this uh, packet, this uh, filter is just uh, only show me SMB2 um, traffic, basically. So you run this, and uh, this is the abbreviated uh, uh, output. It has uh, more information, like a source IP, destination IP, and other things. Uh, so what you see here is the summary view, which is the equivalent of the top of the top panel of uh, what Wireshark shows, if you're familiar with Wireshark. Uh, then if you add the dash, I don't know if it's, yeah. Um, if you add the dash capital V, we'll uh, show you the detailed view of the packets, which is the bottom uh, panel of Wireshark. So again, I've abbreviated uh, what gets printed because it's uh, very verbose. But the idea is uh, everything that is usually um, compressed in the Wireshark uh, panel, is everything is dumped, uh, expanded. So you, it it's, it's goes through the old uh, OSI model, basically, so the first Thing would be uh, I don't know, the Ethernet uh, layer, and then as you go down, you get higher level protocol until you reach SMB2 in this case. So you would have uh, you know, TCP, IP, and all those things. <coughs> so let's look at the uh, XML output. 
So to, to get it, you just pass uh, dash T and PDML, which is the name of the detailed output uh, in a XML formatted way. So you run this and it just pukes this uh, huge uh, XML uh, stuff, uh, which is not very readable, but so I've sort of uh, abbreviated a bit more and this is the, how it really looks like. So you have the, the, your root tag is PDML, and then you have a packet tag, a sequence of packet tag. And each packet tag holds a proto tag, which is a protocol tag. Uh, it has a name. Um, and so each proto tag holds a fields tag. And again, uh, those uh, field tags have a name. Which do, those names are used, if you want to write a filter for a Wireshark, you can use those uh, names. Uh, it has this uh, attribute called show name, which is uh, the humanly readable text which is printed in Wireshark. So using all those things, oh, so fields can be nested as well. Um, yeah. So using all this stuff, uh, you can uh, make this div tool uh, I, I thought about. So uh, you can get this through uh, this uh, URL. So my initial prototype was in Emacs. I'm an Emacs fanatic, so every, usually I use Emacs for most of my things, and I prototype a lot of things with Emacs. So I've put the link here if you're curious, but it's not very usable. Uh, <laughs> I've switched to Python uh, later on to have a proper curses um, UI. So it calls T-Shark in the background and has two modes, a uh, single trace, which is sort of a text mode of Wireshark. You just open one trace, you have the top panel with your summary and then the bottom with the detail. And then the interesting part, the diff tra uh, mode, which you, you pass it two traces and it will show you on two, on two top panels the summary of both uh, traces and then on the bottom, a diff of the detailed packet of each. So this might sound complex, but I'll show you a demo afterwards. Uh, as a side note, uh, this project was accepted in the Google Summer of Code of uh, this year, uh, I mean uh, last year. Uh, so uh, Paul Maro worked on improving uh, SMB CMP. He, uh, he made the initial uh, GUI version of it. So yeah, this tool is really great, but it's SMB specific. And so in the last few months, I've worked on a protocol agnostic version of the tool, which is sort of a rewrite in uh, Qt and C++. So I'll demo both. <coughs> so I have a couple of uh, examples I can show you. Uh, share. So uh, can you all read this? Yeah, fine, yeah, okay. Um, so I will pass two uh, captures. Um, the, the first one is um, this one which is encrypted uh, traffic of uh, someone connecting to a share. And the second one is the same, but the, the name of the share it tries to connect to is wrong. So it doesn't, it fails to connect. And then those two things are, oops, uh, are um, the, the kernel console output that includes the key that are needed for Wireshark to decrypt the traffic. So I pass one for each capture. So I run this. So as you can see, on the top left and top right, you have the summary of both trays. Using the arrow key, you can uh, move both cursors down and up. So the negotiate protocol request packet is uh, exactly the same on both sides. So the diff, the bottom panel is empty. But as soon as I get to the request, uh, you can see already differences. So the difference is the current time. Of course, it's going to be different. And uh, that's pretty much it for this packet. Um, so in this case, both clients are the same. It's the same server, but the option I passed to the client are different. Um, yeah. So in one case, the share I'm trying to connect to is wrong. So uh, we see small differences here, but uh, nothing uh, critical. Okay, of course the window is too, uh, ah. okay. <laughs> so as a side note, you can see from here on, uh, um, the packets are encrypted and so where shall decrypted? Uh, and uh, what I'm looking at is the, what, I, what I'm diffing is the decrypted payload, which is because otherwise diffing the encrypted payload would, would be useless, so that's a very nice feature. So yeah, here on the left side, 
Um, so, uh, you, uh, first of all, you can see the, um, the packets are not synchronized at, the, at this moment. Uh, on the left side, I'm trying doing a tree connect to this uh, local host my share, but on the right side, I'm doing something else. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, move the cursor on the right side to, to match uh, the tree connect. Um, so, so that the diff makes sense, because if you're diffing different packets, it doesn't, it doesn't really, yeah, it doesn't really make sense. Of course, it's going to be different, basically. So here you can see I'm diffing both packets. Uh, so, so signature is going to be different, but that's uh, yeah, not very important. Uh, different flags, but nothing. Yeah, it, it requires some uh, knowledge of the protocol. But here you can see the tree I'm trying to connect to. Uh, it's missing an E on the um, uh, plus uh, line. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, I know the reason why it's failing, basically. Okay, so that was an, uh, one example. Um, I have another one. Okay, so in this case, uh, I have the same client connecting to two different servers. And uh, in one case, something goes wrong with the signing, and I couldn't see, understand why. So on the left side, it's working. So the red lines, the minus stuff is the working case. And on the right side, wait, yeah, on the right side, um, it's the non-working case, so the green lines. Um, so the first thing, the first thing I can notice is uh, on the protocol response, on negotiated protocol response, I can see that um, on the non-working case, signing uh, is not required. It's only available, but it's not required. So this, the server supports it, but doesn't require it. And then later on, it starts to be different from here. So we make this request, and the response on the non-working case is uh, access denied, uh, and so I look around and I notice. Uh, da, da, da. I notice here that uh, oh, wait. in sorry in the request, so the the response is different because it, it's not working. So something is wrong in the request. So I look at the request, and I notice. Uh, yeah, so the signature in one case is all zeros, which surely cannot be right. So I know something goes wrong on the interpretation from the client that uh, it was supposed to sign something and didn't. And so, yeah, it's uh, not properly signed. So of course the server denies it. And so it was all about uh, this, uh, the way the server reported how signing wasn't required, then this is why the client didn't sign, basically. All right, uh, I have another case. So this one is a bit tricky. I have to get to the bottom of the trace. Okay, so uh, on this time on the left side it's the non-working case and on the right side it's the working case. So I have this request, um, the, I have this response, both have errors, but somehow afterwards on the left side it disconnects and on the right side it, it keeps on going. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, something is wrong with this request. I look around and um, the map team means that the the tree um, the tree I'm connected to was uh, connected in a different packet number. So of course it's different traces. So this happens. It's not really impactful. And then the response I see different in time request. But otherwise, again the map team thing. But nothing uh, concerning the real payload. And so from this, I knew nothing was different in those packets on, on, on this request and response. So I knew there was a logic error in the client. 
it's not something I, I knew I did not look at the wire at what writes on what writes on the wire or anything like that. It was more of a logic error. So I could eliminate a whole uh, area to of, of code basically to look at. All right, so that's it for SMBCMP. And I'll, I'll show you the um, new uh, rewrite uh, thing, which is protocol agnostic. Uh, okay, so uh, for the, so I'm, I usually work with SMB. So for this example, I just took something very simple. Um, it's uh, just a different. I've made two DNS queries. Uh, to re like uh, resolving a host name. Uh, in one of them, I mistyped my host name, and so we'll see the difference. So on the left side is uh, the good one. I'm trying to resolve uh, google.com. And, whoops. Okay, so uh, since it's protocol agnostic, you see all of the, um, all of the packets in uh, both traces. But this time I'm only interested in DNS. So I'll type a Wireshark display filter here, DNS, so that it only shows me DNS packets. All right, so it's already a bit more readable. Um, so I'm taking two traces, uh, two packets, sorry. So f uh, since I, it's not uh, protocol specific, I get all the um, protocol in each packet, so the whole stack, starting from Ethernet down to DNS. But I'm only interested in DNS, so here I can type, um, so on, on the bottom pane you have here the name, uh, the ID name of the field, which corresponds to the attribute I showed earlier in the XML output. And then uh, here on the right column, you have the human readable data. So here I'm only interested in DNS, so I can type the ID name of the field I'm interested in. This way I will only get uh, the DNS protocol from now on. The yellow color means uh, it holds changes. So I can see here the, the DNS query ID is different. This is not something I'm really interested in, so I can say, okay, I'm not interested in that field. So I put a comma and I, I put a, uh, like I negate, uh, it's like a, I filter out a field. So I put a exclamation mark first and then DNS, the, the field I want to exclude. So dns.id. So now this thing is uh, removed. And in the query field, I can see yeah, the difference in host names. Um, and uh, yeah, so we can see uh, one, the wrong trace has an extra O there. So yeah, uh, so this tool requires knowledge of the uh, Warshark filtering. Um, you, you need to know the protocol names you, need, you want to filter out. They have specific names in Wireshark, you can look up. Uh, this thing supports uh, the full Wireshark filter uh, syntax, so you can say, I only want to see packets from this host and, and such uh, things. You can type them, those filters here. And uh, yeah. Uh, as a side note, SMB CMP, so the first tool I wrote, is available and uh, I've ported it to Windows. So here it's a screenshot of it running on, uh, in a PowerShell window on Windows. And there's also a GUI version uh, available on Linux and Windows. And uh, yeah, WireDiff is the other tool. Here's uh, the repo URL. It's a bit more experimental. I've uh, uh, worked on it less than the first one. But I think it's the most useful uh, one because not everyone is interested in SMB, of course. Um, so some of the things I want to add to, wire, to WireDiff is uh, a set of predefined filters. So if you're working on a specific protocol, you know what to exclude, what to include, to, have, uh, to, um, to go faster through the packets. Some little quality of life uh, uh, improvements would be also uh, reminding uh, the program should be uh, Remember um, what thing you expanded so that it keeps on expanding those or so that you don't have to click all the time to expand or com com compress uh, fields. And uh, another idea I had is to uh, make diff in the summary level instead of the detail so that you, the syncing could be done automatically maybe if you have different packets uh, happening at the same time so that the, all the matching requests can be guessed uh, automatically. 
So yeah, that's it for uh, my talk. Um, Thanks for that. We've got time for um, quite a few questions. Yeah, one down the front. Are you, if I ask a question which is also semi a statement about other things you could potentially improve, is that okay with you? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, some I'm other sure ideas. It's uh, terrible in many ways. Uh, okay, um, cool. So, some other no ideas illusion on this. for improving filtering could be you could right click on in the, in the trace and then have that just automatically add that to the filter. Right. And in terms of improving visual locality, you could have it so that things that are different are sorted to the top so that you can find the differences faster so that okay. it's always at the top rather than potentially being buried yeah, that's down. That's a good so. idea. But at the same time, sometimes you want to keep the order. Yeah, you'd probably want to have that as a like checkbox or something. Mode. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise, like, awesome. This is super cool. Thanks. Are you going to make a command line version of YDIF? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so I mostly use the com console version of the SMB CMP at the moment. And yeah, uh, I, I, so I've met uh, Microsoft engineers at uh, Plugfest in Redmond, and I've shown him the tool, and he was very interested in it. Uh, but he said uh, it would be nice if there was a GUI, though. <laughs> so uh, I've met the GUI. Uh, now I, yeah, I have both. Uh, yeah. But uh, I think making a console version with all this uh, tweaking, having the tweaking you mentioned, is going to be hard to visually do in a console program, I think. I don't know. I have to think about it. So the tool still sits on top of T-Shark. So if you have plugins that work with T-Shark, it will work with your tool, and you can do arbitrary things? As, as long as uh, your plugin outputs the same XML uh, thing. Basically, if it... If it has a field in the Wireshark GUI uh, that you can expand, probably it just will work. Follow on question, what is your favorite beer because I owe you one? Uh, I don't know. Uh, something I haven't tried here, I want to try. More questions? Do you have a Vegemite beer? Is that a thing? <laughs> <laughs> Kangaroo flavored? Uh, no. Yep, no more questions. Okay, we might um, live with that. So if you could put your hands together and help. Thanks. Okay.